Hey friends, Kevin Maynard here with the There's No Business Like team. As you know, conference season is upon us. You don't need me to tell you about conferences, but if you do, there's a recent episode you can check out called Howie Conference. But you do need me to tell you that we are coming back to the Midwest Arts Expo. Yes, you can see us in the Expo Hall at booth 512. Yes, you can record with us. Yes, you can give us suggestions on future episode topics or guests. And yes, we will be hanging out after hours so we can get to know all of you folks better. So please, come say hi at Max. Hello and welcome to There's No Business Like a podcast where friends and industry colleagues explore topics and interview leaders in our industry of professional theatrical touring. Hello and welcome back to There's No Business Like. I'm one of your hosts, Katie Miller, and I am here on the mic today with Kevin. Kevin Maynard, Quad City Arts, split in the border between Iowa and Illinois. And hello there, Danielle. Oh, hi, it's Danielle Van Hook from the Alden in McLean, Virginia. Welcome, Brian. Thanks, Katie. Brian Zelmer from KU Presents. And last but not least, Josh Benson. Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. Josh Benson, (laughs) Marion, Illinois. Well, it is so great to be with all of you today. So Josh and I are going to bring you a really fantastic interview in just a moment. But before we get to that, I want to ask you all, what would you do if a show you worked on won a Tony Award? Drink. (laughs) I mean, in celebration, not just, you know, drinking in general. Of course, of course. Clear spot on my shelf. Mm. I would probably tell everybody. I mean, I don't think I'd shut up about it. I think every time I introduce myself, I'd be like, hi, I'm Kevin Maynard. I have won a Tony. <laughs> I'd probably wear a pin. <laughs> Ooh, nice. Won a Tony. Oh, yeah. You ask like me that. about my Tony. I'd also like to take Brian's answer, too. You know when you ride a roller coaster and right before you go down, like your stomach like like drops like all the way down? Like it feels like it? Mm-hmm. Like a gravity situation? I think my stomach would fall like like that, but then like into the floor and then like out the bottom of the theater and then like into the earth's core. I think I would just like have an out of body experience for your stomach (laughs) yeah i think i would just be in total shock considering i've never been in a show that would qualify for a tony and then if i won one i'd be like what i mean this is assuming that you're working someone recognized the work i've done well if you've ever heard me sing you would know this is not happening (laughs) i think i would take a picture of that tony award and put it as my like phone screen my like my lock screen so that every time i whip out my phone and open it up in a group of people they'd be like what's that on your screen and i'd be like oh that's my tony award no big deal guys it's just my tony award oh, i think i'd carry it around with me be like oh just what did i put here? oh just set this here oh just oh, like man. put a chain on it yeah so wear it, like, <laughs> a necklace yeah. attached metal. to your belt so it's like can never be taken away i'd go all flavor flav with it <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. how did you guys see this and just you know no big deal it's a tony Well, I asked this question because our guest today actually is part of a team that just won four Tony Awards, the 2024 Tony Awards. Our guest today is Heather Augustine. She is the head of audio and the sound mixer for The Outsiders on Broadway. So Josh and I sat down with her. We talked to her about her career, that Tony Award winning moment uh, back in June, and about her career as being a woman in a technical field in the theater industry. So I hope you enjoy our conversation with Heather. Hi, I'm Heather Augustine. I'm a mixer for The Outsiders on Broadway. I have spent my career in the audio side of theater. I toured for about 10 years before moving to New York, and now I'm here today to talk about that. Hi, Heather. Welcome to There's No Business Like. Josh and I are so excited to talk to you today about your career and your work on Broadway and on tour. So let's just dive right in. So first, we would really love to just get a quick overview of your education and career, your origin story. How did you get to where you are today? Uh, So I found theater when I was in middle school. There was a production of Les Mis that the high school did, and it was one of those dove in with both feet after that. So I did a lot of theater in high school, ended up kind of on the tech side of things because I can't sing worth anything. And we learned to accept that. And so from there, a lot of sound people just kind of fall into it. And that was what happened with me where I knew I wanted to do something in theater. And then when I was applying for college was the, well, I guess I've been doing sound stuff. So I guess I'm going to keep doing sound stuff. I went to uh, Penn State for their tech theater program um, has different emphases where you can do technical direction, lighting, sound. So I did sound uh, and costume technology is a fun kind of little side thing to 
when everybody started spouting off gear, letters, and numbers, I was like, cool, I'm going to go sew some stuff and make some costumes. This has been fun, y'all. <laughs> so, uh, once I graduated, I hopped on the road, and that's kind of what it's been. Fantastic. So how do you go from college to the road? How does that happen? So that has a lot to do with the people that I met in college. There's a couple different companies that sent out touring shows. A lot of times a first national will be sent out by the producing company from the Broadway show. So they'll take it, send it out, produce it. Then kind of once it's done with its first national, there are a couple different companies that'll take it and they'll slim it down a little bit so that it can tour faster and go to smaller cities and smaller theaters and that type of thing. That's where most people start touring, where you start on the bus and truck one-nighters and then you slowly kind of get socialized back into staying in one place for longer and longer times as you get one week tours or multi week sets or that type of thing. So there were a couple of people that I went to college with who were touring and our professor Curtis Craig, he does a very good job about trying to stay up to date with companies like that. So there's the USITT conference that has that's a big technical conference kind of geared towards young professionals, college age, that type of thing. Um, and usually a lot of those touring companies will have a booth there where you can come in, you can bring your resume. And Curtis is usually good about like, hi, you said you want a tour. You should go talk to them. You meet people like that. And then it's also when those companies are looking for people, they'll come in and say, hey, got any recent grads that you might have? Or the, they'll kind of go through resumes and say, oh, this person, great. Uh, so that was, it was a combination of knowing people who are already touring and then also our school having a good reputation for audio people so that they were like, Oh, you've gone to Penn state. Okay. This is for me, it was kind of a unique situation where um, my first tour was Billy Elliot, which has an, a small ensemble cast, the ballet girl ensemble. So it's girls ranging from six or eight to, I think our oldest one was 16, but most of them are kind of like the eight to 12 range. And they were specifically looking for a female A2 because one of the cues that the backstage track has is you go into their dressing room, you're putting tap mics on them. So it's an eight-year-old girl in nothing but underwear and tights around her ankles. You hold tap mics at her ankles as she pulls up the tights and then continues getting dressed. We'd have some venues that we would go to and you most of the stagehands working in touring venues are kind of like... I don't want to say grumpy, but like reasonably crotchety 60 year old men who have been doing this for a while. And they'll kind of sit there being like, well, well, why does it have to? Because in our writer, it originally said there has to be a female A2 local. And so they brought me on. So they didn't have to do that. But you would have the guys being like, well, why do you have to do that? And I would explain that cue to them. And they'd be like, oh, OK, yeah, no, no, no. You go take that. Have fun. Absolutely. And it's like, yep, that's why I'm here. It was a little bit of a unique situation for that. So there were already two Penn Staters who were on the show. One of them was the A1 that was leaving. And the guy taking over for him was also a Penn Stater. And at that point, he and I were dating. So it was one of those like, great, we need a female A2. You are from a college. We are reasonably sure you have some audio skills. <laughs> And you're dating, so hopefully you're not going to fall into an all-out drag-out fight in center stage at one day, but you'll probably be happier touring together. Let's just go. <laughs> and we ended up touring together for about four years, so we worked well as a team. And they and never had that like all-out drag-out fight center stage, which I'm sure production management was very happy about. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> so if you don't have all those connections, Heather, and you're coming out of school, is it like, do you do a mixing audition? like, Or is it really, truly based on reputation and who you know? To like it's get one a of these little, gigs. It's a little bit based on that, but if they have where you can send in your resume, a lot of it is just realizing where you have to send it into is knowing, oh, these are the companies that are production managers for that. So I need to send my resume to these people. Also, that's one of those where I'm a big proponent of just bother people. I love when people come talk to me at the console. I have a stack of business cards that I will happily give to anyone who's like, oh, I do sound. It's like, please email me talk to me. As you bother people, as you talk to people, as you start to learn more about the industry, you'll find out, oh, I need to send my resume to this person. Or even something where if I'm talking to someone who says, oh, I want to go out on tour, like I've been in college for three years, but I'm graduating. I can even send your resume on and say, hey, this person, like they're very active. They're very driven. They seem like they like to tour. So they might be a good fit for this. If you have a tour that's opening, bother people. That's the biggest thing is that if you if you don't have an in on your own, find people who are doing what you do and just say, hi, I would like to do this. How do I get here? 
And USITT is a great resource a great for making yeah. connections if you don't already have them and, and finding your way to people and approaching people at USIT. You started as an A2 on that tour, mm -hmm. and then on Outsiders, you were A1. So we've been talking about A1, A2. A lot of our listeners probably have no idea what we're talking about in <laughs> A standing for audio, one mm -hmm. and two, but still, let's let's dial in. There's, a, there's also a great blog post on sound girls that you wrote on who's who but can you kind of give us a breakdown of the audio world of broadway tour and broadway theater and how that functions within there quickly a1 and a2 we go by several different names the a1 could also be head audio mixer sound engineer nobody's agreed on what the actual nomenclature is for that so it could be any of those and basically they're the head of the they're the head of the audio department they're responsible for mixing the majority of the shows so here on broadway i mix five or six shows a week and then my assistant who is the a2 who is backstage so a2 assistant audio fewer names but still still a couple that you can go through um the a2 is usually backstage so they'll take care of any mic swaps that have to happen during the show, if anything breaks and they have to fix it, they're there basically standing by in case something goes wrong so they can help with that. And then they'll also, in most situations, will learn the mix of the show. So if the A1 gets hit by a bus, they'll be able to step in and then they'll usually mix a couple shows a week just so they're not thrown into a situation like if the A1 goes on vacation or gets hit by a bus that they're just like, I haven't mixed it since I learned it three months ago. It's the, now I've been doing it a couple shows a week. So I'm, I know what's happening. I'm still fresh. Um, and then on tour, the A1 is also responsible for figuring out what's going to happen from venue to venue. So backstage largely stays the same. So you kind of know, okay, the set's going to go here. Wardrobe is going to go here. Racks are going to go here. That type of thing. All the bits and pieces that we bring in it's the, okay, it's it's four walls or three and a half, really, that we put everything in. But the houses where people, the audience where people sit are wildly different from theater to theater. So as the A1, you're responsible for talking with the house head in the venue saying, okay, we have this that we're bringing in. Tell me what's weird about your space that I need to ha have a contingency for well, before we bring all of our gear in. Uh, so the A1 figures out all of that stuff. So on tour, the A1 has to be a little bit of designer production to get everything in because going through the rest of the jobs, the sound designer is pretty much the head of everything for sound. They're the ones that decides what they want the show to sound like with some input from the director. They know what speakers they want to use, what mics they want to use, all the logistics of the system. They'll source sound effects or things like that. Then you also have associate and assistant designers who they'll kind of take on whatever bits of the design that the designer either doesn't like doing or doesn't want to do or doesn't have time to do. The difference between associate and assistant is the associate has autonomy to act on behalf of the designer, where the assistant is there and can implement what the designer wants, but wouldn't be able to change anything without the designer's approval. Uh, and then you also have production people who production people take what the designer says of, I want these speakers, I want these mics, I want this console, I want all of this. And they say, okay, so this is how we have to put it all together. This is how we have to connect it. This is all the gear we need to make it function together to get from point A to point Z. And they'll get all of the nuts and bolts of the system, how the speakers are going to rig, how what the cables you're going to need to connect everything, how everything is going to get set up in a rack and interconnected that way. Uh, and then from there, you have A1, A2, who they're sitting there, they're running the show from day to day. And once... Once the show opens, it's basically just the A1 and the A2 who are running it on a regular basis. And then designers, production, they usually move on to other stuff, but they're they're available via email or phone if you sit there and go, hey, this thing broke. I don't know how to fix it. Or something happened. We've got a new person. This question came up. How in a design capacity do you want me to answer this? Because I don't necessarily, like, I could give you my best guess, but we should probably actually go to the source for this. Also, in, in touring, you mentioned uh, crotchety old men that are <laughs> union hands at the houses. You also are part of IOTC and of ACT, Associated Crafts mm -hmm. and Technicians. How does it benefit you being part of IOTC and ACT from a logistical and business standpoint? How does that fit into contracts and negotiation and, and where all of that fits for you from a business side? For us, basically, to be a touring stagehand, you 
pretty much have to be IATSE, which that is something that if you join a tour, like I did, where I was not part of a union, they basically buy you in where they say, hey, we need this person. They're going to be on the show, so they need a contract. That is the ACT function of it, where it, most cities have a number, like New York is local one. I believe Chicago is two. Pittsburgh is Pittsburgh is a weird one where it's three, where we're just yep. not quite sure how Pittsburgh ended up being three, but there it is. Um, <laughs> and uh, so... For a while, being ACT was kind of looked at as just like, well, you like you don't have a home local. You're just you just got you decided to go out on the road and you haven't paid your dues in a city. And now it's become a little less that where ACT is kind of like, oh, OK, you cut your teeth on tours, not necessarily in a city as a local, but you've still had to work. So it's kind of it's gotten a little bit better where people aren't just like, oh, you're not really a union member. They're like, OK, you just went a different route. We've we've managed to come around to that point. So with being part of IATSE then and then sitting down in New York, do you have space and time for freelance work or is that very limited because of the kind of contracts you're in? IATSE is kind of nice where it's they're kind of like, cool, you can do whatever you need to. You can take non-union work. We're not going to penalize you for that. Basically, as long as you pay your dues, they're fine. They'll have, okay, if you've been on these type of contracts, then we want you to be part of negotiating them or we want you to be part of giving us feedback to the negotiators who are dealing with that. So it's something that if you're not working on union contracts, you're not necessarily part of those things, but you can still be part of IATSE and they're like, great, come on back and work for us whenever you want. But like, if you if you have to go elsewhere and do other things, fine, earn a living, do what you got to do. Would I be correct in saying that they are pretty open and free to that stuff, except for the Broadway non-union tours that go out? Yeah, that, that's something where it's like, OK, like, you know that these are supposed to be union. Don't take a job if you know it should be union, but they are not. But one of those where it's just like, OK, like if you're doing something for a company that like has decent working conditions in that thing, by all means. But yeah, it's it's that whole like if they have specifically said where it's like, don't work for these companies, obviously you shouldn't work for them. But but for the most part, they're like, yeah, like we have no problem with this thing. Go do it. Have fun. But if they're like. No, they either were trying to unionize or something like that, or they've violated whatever standards that we that just general humanity has asked them to. Please don't go work for them. So let's talk a little bit about life on the road on tour. So you have done a number of national tours. So uh, your last one was Mean Girls and Mm -hmm. you did Cats National Tour, which Josh and our listeners know how (laughs) I feel about cats. I love it. Uh, Miss Saigon, Les Mis, Dirty Dancing, Phantom of the Opera, Wizard of Oz, Billy Elliot. Like, that's quite a career on the road. So what does a week on the road look like, Heather, when you're, say, on Mean Girls? So we'll we'll start with what we call Schmooze Day on the road. Um, so that's uh, when Sunday, Monday, Tuesday becomes kind of an amalgamous blob that you don't really know what day it is. And you are you just know if you're in a theater or not. Sunday, what typically happens is you do two shows And then we'll load out of whatever venue we're in, especially for shows like um, I had kind of towards the end of my touring career. Those can take anywhere from five to eight hours to load out. So you're usually loading out into sometime early Monday morning. And then you go back to the hotel, pack up whatever you haven't packed up before or pack up everything if you're really not great at planning ahead. Uh, And then you hop on a bus, you hop on a plane, whatever you've got, and you head to the next city. And a lot of times you'll actually start loading in Monday afternoon. So that same thing, like you finish loadout early morning, you travel during the day, and then sometime in the evening. Uh, Mean Girls was a five-hour call. Saigon and Les Mis were eight-hour calls. You come back Tuesday, usually 8 a.m. Saigon sometimes was 6 a.m. And you load in all day. You do a show Tuesday night. Wednesday, you kind of pass out from exhaustion, and you wake up sometime during the day. Uh, You have one show in the evening on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Sometimes you might have a rehearsal or a work call or something on Thursday or Friday. Um, As the head, you're probably advancing the next venue. So you're spending a little bit of time to talk to whatever venues are coming up or confirm what's going on for the next venue during the days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Saturday, you have two shows. And then Sunday, you start the whole process again. It's grueling. There was on Mean Girls, we had the point where... Uh, We got canceled for two weeks at the beginning of would have been 2022 uh, because that was when Omicron was hitting. So we canceled two one week sits and that ended up being rescheduled for a two week layoff that we had in the middle of the summer. 
And we were all looking at the schedule going, oh, crap. Because what we had was it was going to be nine one week sits, a two week layoff, and then seven one week sits. And adding those two one week sits into the middle meant that we had 18 one weekers in a row, wow. which meant that we did not have a day off from Juneteenth until Halloween. Wow. So a long run. Yes. That's a really long Thankfully, run. we had swing techs, which were able to, one of those where it's you have the best of intentions of like, yeah, we'll be able to swing everybody out like once every two or three weeks. And then, COVID hits, people, other things happen, everything else. So it was kind of, I think, like once a month, maybe we ended up getting swung out. But that was something where we all kind of looked at management and was just like, you know, we're not all making it through this, right? You, you know, this is going <laughs> to yeah. hurt. Yeah. Yeah. And so with a grueling, you know, it, whether it's that, you know, those 18 back to back weeks or any of the other runs that you did, what did you learn about yourself and also taking care of yourself while you're on tour? You kind of learn that you're really bad about it on the road. Uh, you just, you do <laughs> what you can, but there's honestly a lot of time where I would sit there and be like, I'm craving a salad. And I was like, I haven't eaten vegetables in like three days. But to be completely honest, like I probably haven't eaten vegetables in like a week, but we'll, we'll make myself feel better and say it's been three days. But it's a lot of food is easier when it's just you're not really going to the grocery store that much because you can't really buy things in large quantities because you're only there for a week. Like if you're there for two weeks or three, it's a little bit easier where you can actually have some time but we're living in hotels. So you don't have, you might have, you might have a microwave and a mini fridge, but that's not necessarily guaranteed. So a lot of times you can't, you don't know that until you get into the room. So you can't really plan ahead to have, Oh, we, I can get groceries delivered. And then, and then there's some places where you're just like, cool. I had all these refrigerated foods, but I don't have a refrigerator at the beginning of touring. You're really bad at taking care of yourself. As you continue on in touring, you kind of figure out how you need to take care of yourself which is a lot more trying not to eat out as much and trying to actually like go to the grocery store and do that type of thing. Um, social interaction also depends on people where I've had some friends who they were like, yeah, like right after the show, I don't want to hang out with people. I just want to kind of go home, settle in, take a rest. But after a half an hour, they're like, oh, but kind of, I now want to hang out with people. But they're like, but I'm already in, so I don't want to leave. And you kind of have to balance that about like, okay, great. So take your half an hour, decompress, do what you got to do, and then go out. That was actually on Les Mis, uh, where we had a similar schedule to what I was talking about, where I reached a point where I realized that I had been sleeping and working and that was it. And so I felt tired because I felt like all I did was work. And I realized that I had to kind of click out of that and be like, okay, like, we're going to the bar after the show with the rest of the crew. We're going to hang out with people. We're going to do that. Like we need to break this cycle. And I haven't had enough social interaction because like you get to see people during the show and all of that. But at the same time, that's still work related it's things. Work, and you're like, yeah. I, I need an actual social interaction. So for me, that was learning that I needed to pay attention to those things and say, okay, no, like I have been sitting alone in my room watching Netflix more than enough time to like go out and do something or I need to go walk around in the city and actually see sunlight some days. Can I just say, I love the brutal honesty of your answer of <laughs> taking care of myself means, you know, the basics of human living, like an eating a vegetable and interacting with other people and forcing yep. myself to do that because I'm in this cycle of production that creates an opportunity for me to forget, you know, simple human needs. I've got just a couple of tour related questions for you one being being out on tour you encounter a lot of crotchety old white men working backstage yep. as union hands you kind of alluded to a challenge of being a female in an audio role with being questioned just about being the a2 for billy elliott what have you seen on tour that has been a challenge for you in some of those situations with some of the old crotchety white men that are IOTC local I've actually been fairly lucky where I've had some people who like they've told me stories of like gross and overt sexism. And most of the time it's something where they're like, oh, your wardrobe. And you're like, nope, sound. Hi, how's it going? And there were also times uh, where as the head of a department, they'd be like, oh, are you the A2? It's like, no, I'm the head. How's it going? You're gonna be with me all day. There have been a couple times where I had one local um, on my first tour 
where usually you go up, you meet the house head and the A1 will say, hi, be like, hi, I'm Heather. I'm the head. This is my assistant, Cherie, all that stuff. When I was uh, on the first tour, so Josh, who was the A1, did that, walked up to the house head. He, Josh shook his hand, was like, oh, hey, and like, this is Heather, my A2. And you could actually see like him turn, look at me and you could see in his face where he was like, oh, you're a girl. And that was something love Josh to death, but he like can be a little bit obtuse about that. And he even recognized it and was just like, oh, okay. So it wasn't super obvious just to me. Good to know. Cause as a woman, you also feel a little bit overly sensitive to things like that. But that was, I think that was the worst that I had where he was just a jerk. One of those that with me as the A2, they didn't necessarily have to have a female A2 backstage, but some venues would just read the writer and say, oh, female A2. Okay, fine. So we had a lovely woman who was there, but he spent the most of the time being like, oh, yeah, like, I mean, she's okay, but like we have other guys who would have been better. And you're like, okay, fine. So do you find there's a difference between your experience on the road in that regard and then your experience working Broadway shows? Um, and is there a difference between kind of the gender balance in the touring world versus what you've experienced on Broadway? It's one of those where it's definitely been getting better. So, but there, there was also something when I was loading in for outsiders. So first day you walk in, drop your bag in the audience, sit down in a seat, kind of wait for things to start and just looked around. It was just like, I'm the only girl out of an entire crew full of people. It was, it's actually funny because that was, I was talking with our production guy, Mike, and it was just like, women clock this almost immediately where you look around the room and you go like, mm, it's just me. It's just me. Cause it's like, wonderful brain for picking up on patterns to helpfully tell me that I'm the only one here. There, there actually ended up being another woman on the carpentry crew who was there most of the time, but like didn't see her until halfway through the day. And, and you're just like, oh, there's another one. But it was, I had, I had a pink hard hat that I had gotten when I was on Mean Girls. And so what seemed like a fun joke on Mean Girls just felt like a giant beacon on my head when I was the yeah. only one there during the Outsiders load. And it was just like, well, that was fun. But honestly, it's... I get a lot of what I call chivalristic chauvinism where you have like this happened on the road where I would be walking with a cable and like a guy would be like, oh, I can do that and pull it out of my hands. And be like, where do you need this to go? And it's like right there, literally right where I was two seconds away from putting it. Thank you so much for your help. If you could just hand that to me, that would be great. So you, you have that kind of thing. It's like very well intentioned. And then it honestly, most of the time, it's not that completely overt oh, like you're a girl thing a lot of the time. And it's it's a lot of times just listening to guys being like, oh yeah, she's really good at her job. It's like, yeah, and she was hot and blah, 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 and all that stuff. And you're like, okay, at least she was good at her job, came first, but cool. <laughs> That's not a very high bar though. Yeah, I mean, it was actually really funny because I was subbing on Funny Girl. I'm a woman. Uh, the local audio, the local one audio track was also a woman. And both the A2 and the girl she was training to take over as the A2, we were all women. Our designer, Brian Ronan, walked into the room and it was that funny moment of like, you know how fast you clock that you're the only woman in the room? It was hilarious to see it in real time where he was like, I'm the only guy. It's just like, this is a new experience for you. We have this our entire careers. You've never had this before. This is a, and he, he just kind of looked around and just like, you're all girls. It's like, yep, isn't this great? But yeah, it was, it was just funny because he was just like, oh, like these are all people that I've worked with and I like, but I'm having that moment of, I'm the odd, literally the odd man out. There was, uh, in Charlotte, uh, was the, I think the only time in my career where I have had an all female uh, local crew because usually we have about six people to help us load in and out and I want to say there's maybe five um, women audio heads who have been in venues I feel I feel kind of bad because our local A2 lovely man but something I think he had like a stomach bug or something so he couldn't make it for loadout and we had an all-female crew and I'm kind of sitting there being like this is awesome like this is great uh, and my assistant Mark Rivet who love to the moon and back he was sitting there and he's being like this is awesome this is, we have never loaded out this fast these women are great and just and one of those where you're just like it, it's that flip side of it's awesome to have this but at the same time you're kind of like i know as a woman i'm kind of harder on other women because you kind of sit there and be like 
in most cases, it's like you're the only example they have. So you have to be very good at your job because otherwise they think all women suck. But that's just kind of what it is. Because like if one of the guys sucks, there's five other ones. So you're just like, ah, it's just Mike. It's fine. Everybody else is great. It is a lot of weight to carry on your shoulders, though, when you are mm-hmm. the only one of, of any sort of community, right? That's yeah. stepping into that spot and being like, oh, yeah, I'm the only one in the room. I've, Heather, I've had a similar experience clocking that where I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm the only <laughs> the only young woman, uh, the only woman, right? And then dealing with that sort of the chivalristic sexism like you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I've certainly experienced that too. Are there any, anything happening in the industry that you see in terms of um, trying to work towards a better gender balance or working that into being a norm, like a, like a norm Mm -hmm. on Broadway, a norm in touring and like, um, I'm assuming that's maybe why you contribute to Sound Girls blog is, mm-hmm. you know, that is a an initiative that is working towards really uplifting the voices of women in the sound and the technical industry. Yeah, there's definitely been a push, especially in the theater community. Um, that was one of the reasons that I got hired for Mean Girls was I was never explicitly told this, but I kind of got the impression that Tina Fey was just like, can we not find a woman to mix the show? <laughs> And then my resume was, I think, one of possibly the only, if not one of a very few female ones to end up in there. So that was how I got the job. Actually, um, with Brian Ronan, who he's one of those people where it's like he's a normal human, which is kind of weird to find either in theater and especially in sound. And he's an absolute delight to work with. But when I first got the job, I had a lot of people be like, wait, Brian hired you? Because apparently he was kind of notorious for having his little boys club. I loved working with him where he was, he's a very nice, genuine human. And he's one of those people that like, he will take any opportunity to compliment some, like if you're doing a good job or something like that, like we had, the composer was there during tech and Brian was like, yeah, like we've only had the band for two days and Heather's already making them. Like he would, he would go out of his way to make sure that if, if you were doing well, that he acknowledged it. So it was one of those where I'm just like, I don't know why everyone was so concerned but hearing that how that kind of boys club reputation, but that also over the pandemic where everyone was kind of like, OK, we need a better racial balance. We need a better gender balance. We need we we need to find more people that we can actually do this. Brian was really good where he came to me and he's like, hey, I know you do sound girl stuff. So if you have people that, you know, my Rolodex is typically white men. So if you could help me fill that out, that would be great. And that's something which I love because you have someone like this who is very established in their career. He won two Tonys. He's been nominated for, I think, like six or something like that. But he's still sitting there going, oh, there's a better way that I can do this. I've learned more. I need to adjust how I'm doing things. And so you have people like that who are actively trying to be like, okay, I need to expand my horizon. I need to do this. It's something where it's been interesting to see from the white men in the career because you kind of have two different reactions where you have the people who are like, no, I'm good at my job. I'll still get work. It'll be fine. Who are just like, yeah, it's great. Like, this is nice to have more people in the industry. Yeah. Like, please bring people in, do stuff, happy to nurture, happy to help do all that stuff. And then you have people who are sitting there going, "Uh Oh, this is not good. And you have that kind of panic that settles in, which is, it's kind of funny because one of the blogs that I did was basically about like, hi guys. So Now you have to be good enough that you will be hired despite the fact that you're white, despite the fact that you're a man. Welcome to what the rest of us have been doing for our entire careers. The shoe is on the other foot. It sucks. This is not how it should be. But now's the time to be really good at your job. And it's that kind of thing where I actually had one friend reach out to me who is a white man who is a very sweet human, but completely missed the message of that blog and was like, yeah, it's really hard to find a job as a white guy. Like every, and you're just like, Oh, honey. (laughs) Oh, honey. So you have where there's still those blinders on for some people, but you do have the majority of people who are saying, okay, we, we do need different voices. And you're seeing it with the shows that are coming through where there are more shows about people of color and women and things like that, where Outsiders is one of those shows where they're like, we specifically cast this in not, not specifically like a racial way, but like not a colorblind way where all of the socias are white. And all of the greasers are of different different ethnic backgrounds. We have people who are Black, Native American, uh, mixed heritage. So you have that where it's like, okay, we we are trying. And actually, one of our one of our actors, uh, Joshua Boone, who plays Dally, I was listening to an interview where he was just like, oh wait, like 
everyone's just not white in this Tulsa town in the middle of no. Okay, that's kind of cool. So you have where people are starting to create opportunities to say, no, we we want this to be open. We want it to be there. And even our director has specifically said that she wants to kind of create a place where you could cast it however you want, where there's no specific dialogue about like, this has to be cast this way. This has to be this person. This has to be this ethnicity or this type of thing. Well, yeah. thank you so much for sharing that. I know it's not always easy to talk about, but we appreciate your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So you were part of The Outsiders, which just won four Tonys, including Best Sound Design of a Musical. The name of the designer is Cody Spencer, but it feels like an award that belongs to the whole sound department. Very clearly, it is everyone involved from top to bottom with from the A2 with mic placement to the A1 with the mix is a part of that process and a part of crafting that final sound. What was that night like for you, that moment when that show's name was called? We had a watch party uh, for everyone. So the cast was performing there. Um, Most of the designers and creative team were actually in the house because they had been nominated for things. The rest of us were in, actually we were right across the street from Lincoln Center doing a watch party that ended up turning into the after party when everybody could come join us. But even with just, I think it was, I think like 20 or 30 of us there, even that was just surreal because it's, it's one of those where Cody had been nominated uh, for two different shows. Um, One was a co-design for Here Lies Love and then Outsiders, which this was his first solo design. And one of those things where you kind of sit there and be like, I hope we win. Like, we think it sounds good. We've been told it sounds good. You hope we, but you also kind of do like, if anybody else wins, it's fine. It's fine. Like then they announced sound design. And honestly, it was just the whole moment of like, Everybody just starts yelling for us. We're all congratulating each other because it was our associate, um, our programmer, which I didn't actually didn't talk about programmers before, uh, but he was responsible for programming all of the sound effects. And then um, the system that we use actually kind of moves people spatially um, around the space. So he programmed that as well. So we had our associate there, our programmer, it was me, and then our A2. So it's all of us just losing our minds. And then you see on the screen, Cody coming down and like, you can tell he's shocked. Like the look on his face, he's like half red, like kind of one of those where just like, you're not sure if he wants to cry or not. Or like, if he like, he's not going to cry. He's like, Tony's is that weird thing where it's, it's so great to get nominated. Like we got nominated for uh, 12 different awards and we won four of them which this was kind of a tony's where things were spread out a bunch of whole different shows which was kind of fun to see because the weird thing is is where like when you win it means that somebody kind of lost and you feel kind of bad because there's a lot of really great shows out but at the same time you're really so excited that you won and i was i was joking with my a2 joe where it's just like okay literally everything we do from now on is going to be prefaced with Tony award winning where it's a Tony award winning mix. It's a Tony award winning mic rig. It's a Tony award winning button push. <laughs> like everything we do from now on will just be Tony award winning. And you, you just have that moment of like, okay, this is cool. Like this is, this is, it's not something that gets to happen that often, which is also something just working on Broadway is one of those things where since I was in high school, that had been, that had been a thing of like, I want to work on Broadway. Obviously, like that's the biggest thing in theater. So I want to do that. Being here and getting to do that, I've had a lot of people being like, oh, this has been your dream for so long. How much fun is this? How great is this? And when you're coming off a 14 hour tech day, you're like, great. It's so much fun. I just want to face plant into my pillow right now. And you have people go like, oh, oh, not not all it's cracked up to be. And you're like that Tony party. All it was cracked up to be a thousand percent. Absolutely. But yeah, just it's, because it's a dream doesn't mean it's not also work at the same time. Yes, and like and a that, lot of that's hard 100% work. it. Yes. I don't know that you know this about the show, Heather, but we have a time machine. Um, it's one of our favorite things we love to do with guests is put them in our time machine and take them back to a moment in their career. So I would love to take you back in time to your first A1 experience on the road, which is with a national tour of The Wizard of Oz. So what do you know now that you wish you had known then? Other than eat vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that that Heather wouldn't have listened to me about that anyway. It's fine. She <laughs> she learned that several years later. Honestly, just to say it's all going to be fine. There's a lot of stress, especially when you're moving into a new job or something. And that was one of those where I moved uh, from being the A2 to being the A1. And I I remember like I, I sat there with the A1 as he was leaving. And it was it was just like, OK, like, what do I have? to? What do you do that I don't do? How do how do I have to figure this out? What do I have to do? 
you'll learn. It's going to be fine. You'll figure it out. If you make mistakes, that's okay. Just it's going to be fine. But I was half trying to learn the A1 job and half trying to run around and teach the A2 job to someone else where in an ideal situation, you have time to teach them and then you have separate time to go and learn the other job or how to load in a show as an A1 and that type of thing. And I just remember being so exhausted at the end of that day. And it's just that like, it'll be fine. You'll learn it. You'll figure it out. It's going to be fine. Hearing that at that point where I was freaking out about everything and there was a point uh, a couple years later where like I hit the depth of imposter syndrome, but that was also like kind of the slippery slope into it. And just having someone to be like, it's okay. You don't have to know everything right now. You will figure out what you need to know and it's going to be okay. That would have been great. Well, and it clearly it is okay and has <laughs> become okay as you are now the the champion and the lead of the Tony Award winning mix and the Tony yes. Award winning button push. Um, <laughs> all the tour. There's more than one. There are the all the Tony Award winning button pushes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. With that, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Katie and I are so appreciative just to learn from you and to hear your perspective. And really your your honesty and transparency in this interview is so greatly appreciated. So thank you for being with us here today. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And thank you for appreciating the fact that I have no filter. <laughs> <laughs> Katie and Josh, thanks for bringing Heather to us. I thought it was a really interesting story and something unique. We don't really get to hear much about the the audio end of things. And it's so important, as we all know, to the work that we do. And I'm glad that she explained the difference between A1 and A2 and all that. You know, I do think it's interesting that, you know, oftentimes audio does get overlooked um, for a lot of things and in like in, in sort of inner industry. However, it is the one thing that I think always ruins a show. I mean, that like if it's not good or if it's unbalanced or if it's you know, anything like it has the one of the biggest impacts. So I do think it's interesting that we don't, um, as an industry, don't spend too much time talking about it unless you're on the production side of things. It's not fair because you're right. If audio is good, nobody notices it. Yep. But if it's bad, it's the thing that, like you said, exactly. it's the biggest thing that can ruin a show. So yeah, they're they're definitely unsung heroes. Mm -hmm. I also haven't ever really thought about the contracts that technicians and other parts of the industry, other than like actors, writers, and directors are a part of. I mean, I've heard you know, from time to time, but never really kind of thought about how those contracts really work, um, not an equity house, but just kind of hearing that very foundational difference between um, their union and the actors union is really interesting about being able to just go and work wherever. And, you know, having some rules in place about where not to work, but just having like a much more openness. Um, and also, because you, you guys know, I love improv, it reminded me that when the actors were on strike, one of the ways that they could make money was doing improv because it's not covered under actors' equity. Interesting. I didn't know that. So I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to Heather again for her transparency and willingness to talk about gender equity in the touring performing arts and Broadway performing arts industry. Um, I know we've talked about it before, but to have her perspective was really valuable because she is coming at it from you know, a different part of the world that we live in. And I just, I wanted to just say, I did, you know, a little bit of research before we hopped on the mic and I was looking for some stats about kind of the gender equity situation in the, particularly the Broadway world today. The most recent numbers I could find were from 2018, 2019. Any studies looking at that, you know, that part of um, the equity conversation. So clearly we need to do some research, but in my, in my searching, um, I found this really fascinating article from the New York times from 1987. Um, so that's 37 years ago. So it says until recently, such stagehands jobs would automatically have been filled by men. These days, however, those who work on Broadway are getting used to seeing a female carpenter or sound technician or electrician backstage routinely performing duties that were once the exclusive province of males. Although their numbers are still few, in a relatively short time, women have won considerable acceptance as stagehands. Only a decade ago, the New York Stagehands Union, officially known as Local One of the Theater Protective Union, a member of IATSE, was still an all-male domain. The first woman to become a member, Nancy Offenhauser, started her apprenticeship in 1977 and earned her full card in 1980. This year, so that'd be 1987, Local One elected its first female official, She's quoted as saying, they've adapted to it. 
So it just seems to me that even though 37 years ago is seems like a long time in the grand scheme of things, it's really not that long of a time for us to be working towards better gender equity in our field. Um, and it really surprised me when Heather talked about being only one of two women on the Outsiders crew in 2024, when par- in particular, when their director, Dana Tamor, you know, is a powerhouse and she won the Tony Award for Best Direction. She is only the sixth woman ever to win a Tony Award for directing on Broadway, which when I read that or I, I heard that, like, again, sort of shocked, right? But that's right in line with where we are with a bunch of other awards programs, including the Oscars, right? So if that's any indication of the progress or lack thereof that we've actually seen in the industry, you know, I just think that it just shows that we need more attention paid to this in a wide variety of ways. I'll say in the commercial music touring industry, there is rarely any female on the crews of these rock shows and country shows that are touring through. Uh, The tour crews are almost 100% male still. And I know that's a different side of the industry, but there is very little progress on that side of the industry. If there is a female on tour, she's typically a merch person. Um, and isn't an active crew member. And that is a place where on the commercial music side of that industry, it is still so male driven. And I'll back that up, Josh. In my time at Interlochen, the only women I ever saw coming through with large tours were wardrobe and merch. Yeah, I think what I would love to know about some of this information is, one, I'd be curious to know how much has changed or progress or things like statistics have changed since, you know, about 2020, which is a direct relations to what Heather was saying in her interview is, you know, there was a lot of a bigger push for changes in hiring and, and equity there. But I'm also curious, like, where is the, the I say problem or the issue? Like, what is the, the underlying problem? Is it that women aren't going into this field, aren't being trained in this field because, you know, they don't feel welcome or like they don't think about it as an option because it's been so so male dominated? Um, Or is it that, you know, there are actually a number of women who are doing this, they're just not being hired because they're women. Um, I think both are obviously issues. But that's what I'd be curious to see is if we're if we're seeing some of that change by more women going into the industry, and hopefully, by interviews like Heather and the uh, sound girls blog, and things like that, that, you know, will help encourage women to see themselves represented in the field to be able to go and pursue that. I'll also say that in anecdotally, in my experience, I, I share the same experience that you guys have mentioned, where it's by and large, you know, the tour managers coming in and so forth. And the IATSE crews that I've had to work with in various venues have been predominantly men. Although my very, ironically, my very first time working with a tour manager in a production role, it was a, it was a female. And I've had a few women in those tour manager roles or lighting designer roles and things that I've worked with over the years. But again, those are very few and far between. Um, As far as I can also add, again, just anecdotally, it's not scientific, but in my experience here working at a college, and now it's my second college where I've hired student workers to be the technical crew and so forth, um, I've seen a big change in terms of the number of people that we've been able to recruit, Mm -hmm. uh, where before, you know, we always tried to recruit all kinds of students, but it was always just the guys. And in recent years, uh, in fact, in 2020, Kevin was mentioning 2020, I had a, a small crew because of the pandemic of eight technicians, seven of them were female. So, you know, that's a huge change from when I started in 2008 at an academic place. So, um, and again, this is all anecdotal. It's not, you know, I can't use that as that's what's happening in the industry, but I am even seeing it within people that are starting in the training exercises and, and like getting their foot in, in the entry positions to grow to those positions. It's becoming towards a more equitable mix. Well, I'll say like at, with our IOTC local, um, that, that does a lot of the labor work for our theater, the, there is a ratio of, of male and female, uh, within those crews that, that we didn't have 10 years ago. Yeah. And I do want to point out that like, I want to be very clear that, you know, my purpose for bringing that up is, you know, uh, as far as the training versus the hiring, because I think that knowing that can help us uh, address those inequities. Like, you know, where's the root of that problem versus not saying it's like, I'm not saying it's not a problem. I'm just curious, like where that root is. I think when we experience the frustration that at least I have right now, it's a great time to remember that no matter where you are in an organization or what your job title is, you can lead from that position. 
you can um, second the voices around you. If somebody's saying, hey, do we know somebody who's, you know, does X, Y, and Z? Like, that's a great opportunity to suggest someone that maybe management keeps kind of skipping over or to bring up their really great qualities. Um, And then as you climb the ladder, you have to remember, we have to carry that with us, and especially us white people have to carry that with us and remember that hiring, selecting who gets opportunities is just a direct pathway to people being able to also climb behind us. The strides that women have made, we've made strides. There are more women in the industry. There's maybe not as many as would be equitable um, or maybe that would even be great. But if we think about in terms of the number of like non-white people that we see backstage or people outside of the gender binary that we see backstage, I mean, that's also just an incredibly low number. So like, we can't just say we want to raise ourselves up. We need to raise the bar for everyone. And I do think a lot of the initiatives that are happening right now are really taking that into consideration. Yeah, Danielle, that really leads to right of what, what Heather was talking about, just an equity in hiring. Um, and the the blog that she wrote for Sound Girls, which equity in hiring is something that I am really interested in, because it's something that, you know, as a white person, I've sort of struggled with. Um, and I want to, I think this is worth diving into and being a bit vulnerable on because I think for some people, like initially, when you start thinking about, you know, as as equity changes and things change, like it can be hard to wrap your head around. Um, and I want to say, like, I've never felt like it's it's hard to be a white man or it's hard to get hired as a white man. But I have had those like immediate and sort of like intrusive thoughts that, you know, sort of make me think like, oh, it's going to be harder for me to get a job. Um, but thankfully, like I have people that I can talk to and like a safe space to sort of talk about these things to really understand the, the flaws in my logic of that, of like, like how that's not actually the case. And really like that, you know, the reality is that making more equitable changes in hiring doesn't change the number of applicants. Like it just puts us on the same like level playing field. Um, but I looked up that blog that Heather wrote um, because I was just interested to see what that perspective was or what those changes and things were. And so the blog is called Hiring Bias. And, you know, she, to quote her, she said, you know, she said, like, when she was talking to basically white men is you have to be so good at your job that people will hire you despite your skin, color or gender. And I was like, that's great. And then the other thing she like sort of circle back to that is, again, it doesn't matter what or who opened a door for you, your willingness to step through gets you into the room and your willingness to work and learn is what keeps you there. And so like internally for me, like sometimes, uh, you know, when I have sort of those, like when I start thinking about the job fronts is I, I just sort of like tell myself and sort of remind myself that, yeah, I mean, I am good at what I do. I've got a strong network and that I, you know, working to grow and I've been successful with the opportunities that I've given. So this is like why I will continue to be employed. Like it has nothing to do with, you know, gender, race, those sort of things. Um, But like that equity conversation is about elevating everybody to the same playing field. Like it doesn't decrease my chances. Like all it does is just give somebody else like the same leg up that I've had for my entire life. Just to change gears here for a moment, um, when she was ta- when you guys were all talking about touring and she was talking about, you know, basically living in her hotel and just working and sleeping and realizing the importance of the human needs, I thought that was so important. And even though you guys like dug into that a lot, I just I, I don't think that could be shared enough, the importance of socialization and interaction with other human beings and, you know, of course, eating well and all that other stuff, too. But I mean, it goes back to a lot of the things we talk about, how important the hang is in our industry. And and some people look at that as just, oh, they're just having fun or just using it as an excuse for this or that. It's really about that in-person connection one on one, you know, being able to, to sit in a room with somebody and and share human moments and laugh together and all of that and how that transpires to doing a better job overall. Well, and I'll second that, Brian. It's not only important to take care of yourself while you're on a national tour, doing 18 straight weeks, for instance, um, but also just being an arts administrator and living the lives that we live is an important lesson to take with us that you have to take care of yourself if you want to be able to do a good job for yourself, your patrons, your employees, your venue, um, and all the other people in your life, as well as for yourself. I just want to say thank you to Heather once again for 
answering my email in only four hours and saying yes to my request for an interview. It was so generous of her to spend time with us. Josh, thank you for joining me as my co-host on this. I love sharing the mic with you on this. And hopefully you'll join us again next week for There's No Business Like. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to There's No Business Like. Our producers and hosts are Brian Zelmer, Josh Benson, Kevin Maynard, Katie Miller, and me, Danielle Vanho. Views expressed in this podcast are ours alone and are not reflective of the organizations we are a part of. Keep up with us at nobusinesslife.com. There you'll find links to all of our episodes and socials. If you like this podcast, give us a like, a follow, a review, or our favorite, a five-star rating. Oh, wait, what was that site? <laughs> I got it. Don't worry. It is nobusinesslike.com. Do I sound out bus i -ness every time I type it? Yep, sure do. Stay in touch, my friends. Kevin Maynard. Quad City Arts. Split the border between Rock Island and Illinois. <laughs> Sorry, I just decided I was going to stop there. <laughs> Try that again. Like, is there more? Or? Just okay. Kevin Maynard. Uh, okay. Here, I'll go again. Um, if somebody has a great point in a meeting, you can say, "That's a I want to second that. That's a great idea that that person had. Um, and then as you... I prefer to just restate the idea as my own. <laughs> and oh. then the rest of the men in the room will agree with it. <laughs> I also prefer to restate the idea as my own. See what, didn't you feel better about that? <laughs> Honestly, after hearing her talk about A1 so much, I'm like dying for a steak. <laughs> <laughs>